Hi, this short video should uh, help you to annotate Tracy K. Smith's poem, The Universe Original Motion Picture Soundtrack. This poem is the second last poem in the prescribed suite of poetry by Tracy K. Smith. And it's also in the actual anthology, Life on Mars. Uh, it's actually situated as the last poem in the first section. So the anthology Life on Mars is split into four sections, one, two, three, four, and this poem is the last poem in the first section. So the poem was written while Smith's father was still alive. So this is uh, pre-2008. And, well, a lot of the, the tone of the poem um, you know, tone is not static and tone kind of changes throughout um, as we read, but it kind of moves between um, hopefulness, then we get into a little bit of contempt, and then perhaps a glimpse of nostalgia towards the end. It's a short poem. In terms of structure, um, it's only got 12 lines. Um, it uses a lot of enjambment uh, where some of the some of the lines actually continue on into the following stanza. And you can kind of read this poem um, like split into certain sections by, you know, taking into account the enjambment um, that's within it. But it is the shortest poem of the prescribed text list. But also it's it's brilliant in the way that she can holistically use metaphor and personification as a way to give the universe its original motion picture soundtrack. So the universe here is the star in its own movie, right? I mean, no pun intended there. But the, the title of the poem, The Universe Original Motion Picture Soundtrack, it helps convey kind of the content or the ideas within the poem, right? That this is an original thought and that the poem, the poem is purely audible both as um, as music is like a, a universal kind of human quality and that it talks about and uses this kind of meta narrative um, of music as a way to describe uh, its thoughts and its feelings. And by it, I'm talking about universe. So Tracy K. Smith, one of her one of her stylistic features in her own poetry is that the idea of it replaces these grand kind of metaphysical concepts and concerns about the universe, fate, destiny, and science, okay, mostly concerned with um, with scientific rationalisation and, and things like that. So without further ado, let's um, let's have a look and try and annotate parts of it. Okay, so it opens with, the first track still almost swings. Well, I kind of think that we talk about the very opening line here. We know that it's got the musical connotations. The first track opens, it still almost swings. Okay, so the very first track of the universe's soundtrack is that it's, um, it, it opens with this kind of maybe initial idea of what I think to be the Big Bang, okay, in terms of the first track or the first idea of the universe from the Big Bang. Um, and it brings in this this idea like the initial explosion of life and of sound, and particularly in, in swing music, right? It's quite happy, it's upbeat, um, and because the entire poem looks at the universe from a musical perspective, you know, like its own soundtrack, it really tells us and gives us that um, that idea from the opening lines, okay, that this is basically the soundtrack to the universe's life, all right? Uh, the whole poem is audible in the way that not only does the language imply uh, sound and structure and like a, a real kind of melodic rhythm that is given through the spoken word, um, but also the fact that it's using this idea that the, that the universe has its own life soundtrack. So it opens with the first track that still almost swings and then High hat and snare, even a few bars of sax, the stratosphere will singe out soon enough. All right, well, we've got a qu we've got quite a few instruments in here. We've got the hi hat, we've got the snare, we've got the saxophone. And eventually, it comes in with the strings as well. So all the all the instruments here are unified. All right, they're unified in their way for um, the music and the the use of the, the swing music, and also that. 
the repetition of the S sound, okay, almost swings, hi-hat and snare, even a few bars of sax, the stratosphere will singe out soon enough, synthesize strings. That beautiful sibilance there where the S sound is musical and it's measured, okay, it's peaceful, all right, very, very, very pretty for, you know, the opening song of the universe's life. Then we get, so I'll just put oh, the snare, the sax, the stratosphere, all these kinds of S sounds that help and the synthesized strings that help convey, convey that sense of sibilance. Then we get, then something like cellophane breaking in as if snagged to a shoe. Well, the cellophane is not musical, although we could argue it is used to make some type of noise. It, it definitely interrupts here, right? And it interrupts this, this peaceful, um, beautiful opening track for the universe. And the cellophane breaks in as if snagged to a shoe. So the music is, the, the, the sound of the cellophane, it's caught on something, right? And it's creating this kind of unpleasant um, sound. If it's snagged to a shoe, we're not getting a really kind of nice or a positive image here. Um, of this interrupting cellophane that's snagged to a shoe. And it says crinkle and drag. All right, now she's kind of giving us a bit of synesthesia here in the sounds of the, cr the crinkle and the drag, also relating it back to, um, you know, the cellophane that's snagged to a shoe. Now, my interpretation, and, and many others as well, is that this, this interruption is actually humanity, okay, that the crinkle and the drag um, is representative of humanity, okay, and of, I suppose, our, our place in understanding or looking at the ideas of, of the universe. She then gives us a little bit of enjambment, all right, so white noise, black noise. Now, white noise, again, associated with the, the musical metaphor, right, but it's static, okay it can be ambient sounds can also be kind of quite calming black noise however black noise is that kind of deafening silence all right the the zero the nothingness and so when you put those together she's really kind of interrupting the the initial tracks of the universe's soundtrack with something that isn't welcome or at least, you know, it's still musical in its own right, but it's not as peaceful. It doesn't adhere to the same type of tone um, as the universe originally starts with in its first initial track. Then she goes on, what must be voices bob up and then drop like metal shavings in molasses? All right, well, the voices, the voices is us. This is humanity, all right, and she gives us this, really powerful um, simile that's powerful on, on many layers, okay, on many levels. So she says, like metal shavings in molasses. Now, when you talk about the metal shavings, we, we kind of connect with things like, you know, the metal shavings can be sharp, cause sparks, they're shiny, and then they kind of get dropped, okay? They get dropped in molasses, which is this really kind of like purified version of sugar cane. It's black, okay? and it gets dropped into the blackness. There is no sound, the voices kind of go up and humanity's voices, you know, go up and interrupt and then they're abruptly gone, all right, into the molasses and, and sink down or whatever. Then the universe kind of speaks again, so much for us, so much for the flags we bored into planets dry as chalk for the tin cans we filled with fire and rode like cowboys into all we tried to tame. Well, here's where that tonal shift of contempt kind of comes in, right? The so much for us part. I think the us stands for, well, it's, you know, a collective noun used for the entire universe, okay? Something grander and larger than humanity can, can really kind of comprehend. Um, but we are really, we are really set here against the platform of space, right? So much for the flags we board into planets dry as chalk. 
I think she's kind of talking about, you know, our human endeavours that we've been destructive and that the universe is disappointed in our types of actions, right? The tin cans we've filled with fire and rode like cowboys into all we tried to tame. So Tracy K. Smith and the universe representing us as unruly children, right, or unruly people that cannot be cannot be taught or cannot learn, or at least we must learn the hard way, right? I think she's also referring to um, our humanity's obsession with innovation and progress and particularly how this has led to things like war and what a, what a waste that really is on, on humanity and that we are detrimental to the universe's own soundtrack. We are a bleep. We are, a, a, you know, a, a tonal shift and an interrupting silence that causes a bit of contempt and causes a bit of a problem. Then she tells us to listen. The dark we've only ever imagined, now audible, thrumming, marbled like static, like gristly meat. So I, I kind of want to bring back for a second that the chalk, the tin cans, the cowboys, these are also they're all man-made, all human endeavours, right, that have either been a part of um, you know, creating widespread war or that have ruined parts of the planet in terms of causing like oppression and, um, and, uh, and, you know, quite a lot of drama and issues that humanity's history has had to deal with and learn. But when she gets to the, the dark we've only ever imagined now audible, audible, we start to get into the more chaotic sounds and images, okay? This is the second part of this poem is not like the first, you know, with this beautiful opening track, all right, of the, of the swing song. No, we get now the dark kind of images, the thrumming, marbled with static like gristly meat. Another brilliant um, simile that she uses here because the marble like with static through gristly meat is kind of uh, conjuring up an image of the fat that goes through meat and that kind of looks marbled, right? Again, we kind of get this, uh, the man-made kind of stuff, you know, just like we had the, with the tin cans uh, and the cowboys um, and the continued metaphor, the audible, the thrumming, a chorus of engines churns. Again, man-made, man-made tools, right? But that the musical imagery still is present here, but not necessarily in a positive or a calming sense. And then she tells us that silence taunts a dare. So the silence kind of uh, relates back to the black noise that we've got in that third stanza. And the, the taunting or the dare part is, you know, who's doing this to who? Is, is humanity taunting the universe or is the universe taunting humanity? She says, everything that disappears, disappears as if returning somewhere. Now, we get that really nice rhyming couplet that you've got that you only really get when you read it out loud. So silence taunts a dare. Now, everything that disappears, disappears as if returning somewhere. Well, I kind of think that if she if she's mentioning or representing the ideas of the Big Bang in, in the early track, right, the very first um, track for the universe, that the end here perhaps could be representative of like a spiritual afterlife or a meaning found elsewhere, right, a grander purpose. Now, whether or not that grander purpose is talking about our, our human life and where our purpose is or whether or not it's the universe's, that much is kind of, it's, that's kind of unclear. But here's where I think we, we really get at the heart of the whole poem. So if humanity thinks of themselves as dramatically important, right, we, we're placing our social footprints and our history at the centre of all things that we like to do. The universe, right, because this is from the universe's perspective, we, to them, we are but a speck in a much larger cosmological consciousness, right? Our, our entire species of humanity will die or will commit omnicide, um, like will be the killing, will be the makings of our own death, and it won't really even register to the universe. The, the whole poem is a little bit nihilistic in the way that it's talking about how like how life has no meaning but 
it's also it also makes us have some moments of introspection for ourselves okay for for again the larger unknowable questions of the universe that move beyond human consciousness i think it's pretty profound that tracy k smith can uh you know use her artistic prowess to tap into what those much larger questions are to remove from from the care and concern of oneself and our busy lives into these larger um, larger questions but overall you know she uses these kind of um, musical imagery to evoke all of our senses right and and to personify the universe as someone bigger and larger than anything we can ever ever imagine so how does the poem connect to the reimagined world's rubric well just some of my thoughts you know smith she she reimagines the universe as having its own life soundtrack right both personifying it and using auditory imagery and, and metaphors to depict the life story of the universe how it's kind of managed hardship and, and disappointment with humanity's foils but that in the grand scheme of things it means very little so smith experiments with things like the spoils of war technological progression um to make us consider our own complicit actions that we are causing the earth she really forces us to listen to the damage caused by things like you know industrialization and war and waste and things like that and i suppose the the whole metaphorical presentation gives us these these reimagined ideas of spaces beyond our current thinking right this kind of becomes um, the way that she provokes thought out of us and that humanity itself has just really um, really become a speck of sort of nothing in an otherwise beautiful, vast, dense universe. I hope you have some good notes um, and annotations for the Universe Original Motion Picture Soundtrack by Tracy K. Smith. Um, my name is Dimitri Skadanis and thanks for tuning in.